Good day, Will. Um, first of all, please let me thank you for agreeing to do this uh, video interview with me over Skype. Um, for our audience, I just want to go back to, to, I think I met you at an ISPI conference a dozen years ago or so, and we've been connected on LinkedIn and Twitter since probably about 2007. I'm a big fan of your blog and your writings, uh, your research papers, but could you, for our audience, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about where you live and where you work, what you do, and some of the more interesting things you've been working on? Sure. And thanks, Guy. I appreciate the uh, invite. Uh, it's always good to chat with you. Uh, so, um, well, I'm Will Tallheimer, and I live in Somerville, Massachusetts, uh, right next door to Cambridge. In fact, I think if I look out my window, I can see the William James uh, Hall over there on Harvard's campus. <laughs> uh, they have nothing to do with me. Um, but, uh, yeah, and so uh, what I've been doing for the last 20 years, uh, working through my consulting practice, work learning research, is to try to bridge the gap between the research side and the practice side. And uh, I do that in a bunch of different ways. Um, I spend a lot of time reading the research. So probably looking at, on average, over 200 articles every year from the scientific referee journals on learning, memory, and instruction. And then sharing that in the work that I do. So keynote addresses, speaking, uh, workshops, learning audits. Um, and now I've been getting into uh, learning evaluation work and of course, something that you and I hold dear, the work of debunking the myths in the field. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, a couple of years ago, I started a group, the Debunker Club. We now have over 700 people from throughout the world. And we try to gently, respectfully, um, and with open minds, try to debunk some of the myths that are out there. So, uh, yeah, that's been fun, and uh, you are probably <laughs> one of the big world's biggest learning debunkers. So <laughs> it's good, good, good to have you on. I'm glad to be on your team. Well, uh, thank you. Of course, uh, it was something I picked up from the uh, notables, the luminaries, the uh, my mentors at NSBI and ISBI back in the day. Uh, one of my favorite stories is that at a conference, um, maybe they weren't as respectful as as. As you would wish them to be nowadays, but uh, people would stand up in the middle of a presentation and shout to the speaker, do you have any data to support that? And <laughs> invariably, somebody else on the other side of the uh, audience would stand up and yell, and data is plural. And <laughs> it was my signal that what I was hearing uh, perhaps wasn't legit, or there were conditions on it that uh, uh, complicated the whole matter. But uh, so I truly support what you've done with the Debunkers Club. Um, I would encourage everybody to uh, take a look at that site. I will publish that site along with the video uh, when we're done here. But in, in particular, um, you first sponsored a challenge and offered $1,000 to anyone who could uh, prove the existence of learning styles. Tell us a little bit about that. Well... I'd seen the research, and this is like, I, I forget what year it was, but it's been almost eight, nine, ten years or something since that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, well, this will be a good way to get the message out because it didn't seem like people were paying attention. There's still learning styles was everywhere, every conference presentation, not only in workplace learning, but in the education learning field. And so I thought, oh, this is a good way to get it out there, thousand bucks. You know, I could afford that if somebody comes through. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I said, okay, well, how can we do this? So the, the challenge was um, use learning styles in your training. Um, and it was e-learning so that it could be documented. Uh, show us that if you used it, that it actually creates better learning. And there's a series of, you know, uh, sort of rigorous research-based kind of uh, factors that you have to prove. And anyway, nobody s has stepped up <laughs> to, to, to fund that. And then a few years ago, uh, Tiagi said, Will, I got a bunch of people that want to bolster it up to $5,000. So it's now people, other people put up money 
And uh, so now we have a $5,000 challenge and still nobody has come forth to show that this actually works. So. We, we may have to offer more money uh, to, get, <laughs> to get somebody to take it seriously. But it's good that that brings attention to that uh, particular myth. I see on the back shelf behind you, you have Clark Quinn's uh, latest book about uh, myths as he addresses uh, many of those prevalent myths in our field. But I'm going to segue over to the book on your other shoulder, which is your performance-focused smile sheets. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about uh, that book? Sure. Um, a number of years ago, I think about 2007, I started thinking about learning evaluation. And I was actually looking at the research on learning. And I was thinking, well, wait a minute, if this is true about learning, the way we're measuring our learning interventions is really biased. So I'll just, you know, one of the basics is that we know people forget, right? Mm -hmm. So we teach them stuff, it's top of mind, but after the training ends or after the learning experience ends, then they're liable to slide down a forgetting curve. But when do we measure learning? You know, at the exact end of a learning intervention. So we're, it's really a snapshot of whether the learners understand it at that point in time, but it doesn't tell us whether they're going to be able to forget it or remember it. So I started thinking about that. I wrote a, a research to practice report on that, and it got a lot of resonance. I got invited to do consulting and speaking. And so I, I, I really, you know, I'm a research-based guy. But I know that research is really a first step that if an organization is focusing uh, only on research and not getting sort of weekly or monthly feedback on how well they're doing, they're gonna have a lot of blind spots. So uh, to me, learning evaluation is one of the ways that we make ourselves effective, that we make ourselves, you know, ethical <laughs> as well, you know? If we don't know how we're doing, then we, we have a real problem. We're not being the professionals that we aspire to be. Um, so focusing on this, a few years after that, I came across this research on smile sheets. And there was a, a meta-analysis that I came across that showed that uh, smile sheets were correlated with learning results at 0.09. Mm -hmm. And if you remember from your statistics, anything below 0.30 is, is considered a weak correlation. 0.09, virtually no correlation at all. Geesh. So I, you know, I let that sit on the back burner, but then another meta-analysis came out, and like 10 years later, found the exact same thing. So I said, well, okay, so maybe we should just throw these things out, these smile sheets out. Well, after some reflection, I realized organizations are not gonna get rid of them. They're a tradition. There's also some good reasons to ask learners for their feedback. Uh, number one, it's respectful. Uh, number two, you know, it allows them to get their feelings out in the open. Um, I was a trainer. Um, I was a highly mediocre <laughs> leadership trainer, but I was a trainer. And I learned some things from the comments there. So I knew that. Um, but I also asked myself, well, can we make them better? So that's how the book was born. I decided, yes, we can make them better. We're never going to make them perfect. There's no perfect measurement. There's And learning is really complicated. So learning measurement is even more complex. So we're never going to be perfect about it, but I think that I've developed a method that gives us better feedback, particularly focused on learning effectiveness. Uh, the previous smile sheets were good about getting learner satisfaction, reputation of the course, but not so much on whether the course and the learning design was effective. So that's been my focus. Um, and I've worked with clients now since the books come out and they're getting a lot better feedback. So I'm sort of happy that it's resulted in that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but I think, you know, I think it's one of our blind spots, this learning evaluation. Um, well, that's a so. nice segue into some of your more recent work. Uh, you've come out with the learning transfer evaluation model. You're on version 12 of this and <laughs> you have uh, uh, branded this, I guess is the right term, uh, LTEM. LTEM. Tell well, us just a little bit easy. about LTEM and how you got to 12 iterations of this and how it syncs up with your book on performance-focused smile sheets. Sure. Um, well, I've been out there talking and thinking about learning evaluation for a long time, 
and there's still a lot of mythologies about it. People still aren't doing a very good job with it. They're still struggling with it. They, if you look at some of the, uh, you know, organizations do surveys in our industry. And one of the, if they ask about learning evaluation, are you happy with the learning evaluation you're doing? Oh, overwhelming, you know, no, we're not. Like, uh, uh, Towards Maturity did a, some research last year and found, and asked L&D managers, are you, are you happy? 97% said, no, we're not getting the data we need. And, you know, so that 97%, that's like everybody, you know, except for a few crazy people. Um, so there's been a real need. And... Um, I looked at uh, what research scientists said about like the Kirkpatrick model. And I looked at the Kirkpatrick model myself and thought, well, it's missing some real key elements. Uh, for example, level two is, is just learning. Well, learning is very complex and it doesn't really capture it. And what, what happens is it sort of sends a message to people that, well, you have to measure learning. Mm -hmm. And so they default to the easiest possible way to measure learning, which is like knowledge checks. Mm -hmm. And we know that for most jobs, having knowledge alone is not enough, right? I mean, maybe yeah. if you're a cashier and you have to know the product codes for the avocados, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe knowledge is a, is a fair methodology there, but for the most part, no, we need, people need to be able to make decisions, actually do things. So uh, the Kirkpatrick's model has some weaknesses and it's the dominant model. Other people have put forward models, but they haven't really stuck. So mm -hmm. I finally, I saw some clients having some struggles and I said, okay, now's the time, I gotta do something. So I started trying to crank it out and I developed like a 12 level model and then a 14 level model and then a 15 level model. And then I started to get input from you know, some of the smartest people in our field, you know, evaluation experts, learning experts, um, some of the big names. Um, and uh, they said, well, Will, you know, you've got too many levels, number one. It's going to drive you know, the wall. So I started cutting it back, um, but trying to make sure that there's some essence in there that, that is powerful. So you, you, want to, you want to sort of balance the power with the usability. So um, finally, I have eight, it's, and I don't call them levels because that gets people confused with Kirkpatrick. And sometimes I want to talk and use the Kirkpatrick levels mm -hmm. so, because that's what everybody knows and it makes sense to people. Um, so uh, now they're tiers, eight tiers. So Yes. Yeah. Well, excellent. Um, and you, I, I noticed when I downloaded the uh, 12th uh, version 12 that you said this is, that's going to be it for a while. Are you, are you sure about that? Well, no, I'm never sure about it because, you know, I, I mean, the one smart thing I did on all this is to ask people for input. Mm -hmm. So not only did I seek out people that I respected in the field, but I also, uh, ISPI had a conference in Norfolk, design thinking conference, and I shared my um, sort of design, design thinking pathway into creating this thing. And... Uh, You're, it's, it's, you're Hold on, I'm getting rate. signals here. Okay, sorry. Okay. Um, and so people get that conference, and then I took it to the conference in London and show 11, and I got more feedback. And so, um, but at some point, it has to sit for a while, and it's, it's sitting, it's fermenting, and <laughs> uh, people are now using it. I've had two people come to me, and it just came out in February, but two people have already come to me. They're doing their dissertation on it, so. Uh, organizations are using it, so it's, it's pretty exciting, actually. Excellent. Well, I, I encourage everybody to take a good hard look at that and uh, think about implementing it, of, co of course, with your consulting help, um, should they need that. <laughs> Let me segue a, a bit to here. Um, we're, we both are members of ISPI, the International Society of Performance Improvement, and they have branded their approach to improvement as human performance technology or performance improvement, there, there's many different names for this, but can you tell us a little bit about your first exposure to performance improvement or HPT? Sure. Um, well, I'm gonna go 
I probably have a different pathway than a lot of people. So, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a learning guy. And so my first exposure to thinking about learning was actually um, behaviorism. And, and I know a lot that resonates with a lot of people in ISPI, uh, but uh, I, I went to college uh, back in uh, like 1977 or so and uh, took a course on like educational psychology. It's, it's kind of fuzzy, you know, mm-hmm. I'm 60 years old this year, so. Congratulations. Uh, yeah, thank you. And uh, so uh, I took a course on educational psychology, and the guy was a behaviorist. And then there was a, a conference in Philadelphia. I was in Westchester, Westchester State College. Um, and uh, there was a conference, uh, I think it was the Eastern Psychological Association. And Skinner was the keynote. And I don't know if it was 77 or 78, it was around that time. And it wasn't like a, what I remember of it was that it wasn't like in a big ballroom kind of thing, but it was like in this thing, and and, and, and Skinner was up on this like pulpit. I don't know if it was in a church or what, <laughs> but, um, and we're watching, you know, and in psychology, and although at that time there was, you know, um, he was getting pushed back, the cognitive psychologists were rising up, you know, Bruner and those guys, and all of a sudden, and I'm like a undergrad, right? So I'm like in awe of everybody. And but all of a sudden we're in this ballroom or whatever it was and the lights went out. But I mean completely completely blacked out, but the uh, Skinner's microphone still worked. And this is what he said. He goes, "Those damn cognitive scientists." <laughs> <laughs> Everybody broke up. It was great. So, and the lights came out. So I, I read all Skinner's books. I was really fascinated. I, I, I called myself a behaviorist. I was a believer. Um, and then a couple of years later, um, I transferred to the University of Michigan. Um, my goal at that time was to become a clinical psychologist. And my advisors there at Westchester State said, well, you really got to go to a better school, you know, mm-hmm. big program. So I went to the University of Michigan. And there I took a course on memory and by John Janitas, and who's a big memory researcher and uh, well-known. And uh, it was amazing. I was like, wow, this is incredible. This is really interesting. And he taught really well, and it's great. Um, I, still, I still felt I was a behaviorist. A couple years later, though, somebody said, well, you know, Will, that memory stuff, that's cognitive psychology. <laughs> and I go, oh, oh, well, I guess it's not so bad after all. <laughs> so anyway, mm-hmm. you know, that got me started. And I'll tell you, one, one of my other major influences, um, after Michigan, I transferred. I wasn't running from the law, but I transferred to uh, Penn State, <laughs> Pennsylvania State University, to finish up my undergrad. And I took this course called... Um, Cognitive Basis for a Belief in ESP Phenomena. Hmm. And the professor, and I'm sorry, if I don't remember his name, but uh, he had us read this book by two Stanford physicists who had studied, you know, some of the great ESP people, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, we all read this book and like, oh my gosh, we were completely like convinced. And then we read this other book that completely debunked all these experiments that these folks had done. And to me, and I was suckered in, because I wasn't really, you know, a lot of people believed, but I was sort of skeptical. But then I read this first book, and I, you know, by these physicists, I thought, oh, this is really good. Mm-hmm. But then I saw the debunking. So, you know, it was like the veil came off, and I realized how easy it is to be sucked in. So it was a major experience for me. Um, so that's how I got started, uh, you know, early on. Well. Interesting. So besides those that you have mentioned, um, who are some of your other biggest uh, influences back then or even today? People, articles, books um, that you might recommend to people in our audience? Oh, sure. So, um, well, as I said, I spent a lot of time looking at the research. So I have some research uh, folks like Harry Bayrick. and he did all this great research on the spacing effect, 
Um, and, you know, he, he stayed at a small school his whole, you know, tenure as a professor, but created this great research and some of the research he did with his family. And Robert Bjork, um, you know, did some early research on retrieval practice, um, you know, great stuff. Uh, and of course, my dissertation advisor, Ernie Rothkoff, who did the work on learning objectives, um, and I learned you know, a lot from him. Uh, recently, uh, you know, one of my heroes is Ruth Clark, because what Ruth does is take the research and translate it. And uh, she worked with Richard Mayer to do a lot of that. Um, but that work is really and I've been doing this for 20 years now, that work is really hard. And um, when I started out, I didn't know Ruth existed. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, she was the first one to really be successful in doing the research to practice full time. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I recommend her books. And, and now there's a lot of things to recommend. Uh, Clark's book uh, on the debunking stuff, uh, Julie Dirksen book, uh, books on uh, how people design for how people learn, um, make it stick. Um, you know, so there's there's a bunch out there now that uh, are really good. I, I, in fact, it's a really exciting time to be in the learning field because over the last 10 to 15 years, the research is really solidified. We have real good, strong recommendations we can make. So, mm -hmm. yeah, great stuff. If you were to give us a 30-second elevator speech on what it is you currently do, how do you do that? Many people struggle with explaining themselves to their family, their neighbors, or professional colleagues, the CEO. Uh, what yeah. is your spiel? Well, um, I might have... I might have uh, hinted at it earlier. What I say is I try to translate research into practical recommendations. Now look at the scientific research. Um, I do that with uh, <laughs> some humility because when you start looking at research, you realize you couldn't possibly get your head all wrapped around it. Um, no one person can do it. Uh, but you know, looking at the research, trying to develop wisdom from the research practical wisdom because you can't take it and just hardwire it into your practice. You have to think about what it means. You have to not just read one study, but you have to read 10 or 15 or however many it takes to really, you know, develop that wisdom. Um, and, uh, you know, so I take it, I translate it. Now, the truth is <laughs> that research doesn't always pay, right? I don't get paid for doing research. Well, every once in a while, but mostly I have to utilize that in the work that I do. So, mm -hmm. like I said, speaking, keynotes, workshops, the learning evaluation stuff, uh, that kind of thing. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, as a lifelong learner, uh, where are you focused now or next? Where, what are you learning about and writing about? Or Well, um, you know, I, I'm continuing with my interests, so the research, learning research in general, mm -hmm. uh, debunking, uh, but I've turned a lot to learning evaluation mm -hmm. because I think there's um, a real opportunity there to uh, make a difference in the field. If people evaluate better, they'll get better feedback on how they're doing, how their organizations are doing. They'll be able to create better learning that's more effective for their learners, that wastes less time. Uh, and money mm -hmm. on things that don't work that well. So that's that's really where um, I see myself going forward for the next five years or so anyway. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Is there a favorite HPT or other term in the profession uh, or phrase that uh, you would like to define for us because you feel the current understanding of that term or phrase is problematic? Okay. Um, well, don't, don't, okay, well, okay, so I'll jump into the, I'll jump into the debate right now. I, I think that the, the term uh, performance technology or performance technologist has not been that helpful um, in conveying what we do. Um, okay. I think it, I think it's too cold and steely and uh, I don't think people get that. Um, I don't know. I don't have a 
I'm not sure I have a better replacement. Um, but NSPI was uh, the National Society for Performance, well, for programmed instruction, then performance improvement. Um, now we're international. Um, I kind of like performance improvement a little better. Uh, but but anyway, so that's that's sort of a side thing. But you know, I, I do. You know, learning is what I'm interested in. To me, um, you know, learning, if we help people learn, we can help them do things that they haven't been able to do before. Uh, we can also maybe even help, in some sense, some instances, we can help them be something they haven't been before, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, really. Um, if I think about my skills now versus when I was, you know, a young lad, I mean, I've really improved and changed, and I, I feel grateful to have this ability to learn. Um, one of the, you know, people, people get learning messed up in their heads. You know, they think, well, I was in kindergarten and then first grade and on up through college, and I know how to create learning. Well, I think that's silly, you know. The research shows that most of us don't know learning that well. We don't know how to improve our own learning. We don't really, you know, there's some blind spots that learners have. Um, the thing that I've tried to focus on are what are the most important things? Because we know like a hundred things or a thousand things, there's, you know, affect learning results. But if we focused on the tangents, it doesn't make sense. I mean, I, I like to think of this in terms of DNA. Human DNA is 99% the same as like chimpanzees and bonobos. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's some of that DNA, and I think it's the same thing. That's why, you know, I, I've come down with the decisive dozen, the 12, what I call the 12 most important learning factors. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm 100% sure that these are the most important, but that we ought to focus on these things first, the things that we know work first, um, before we go off on to things that are tangential, like learning styles, and yeah, that kind yeah. of thing, <laughs> to bring us full circle. <laughs> so you so you don't like performance technology or performance technologists, but it wasn't there an exchange just within the last several weeks here about engineer, using the term engineer? Yeah, I mean, that's one one option is, you know, being a learning engineer mm -hmm. um, in the sense that what engineers do is they they take science and they apply it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, we in learning should take the science and apply it and also develop the methods that engineers have uh, for, uh, you know, getting feedback and all that, you know, being a professional, all that kind of stuff. So I, I don't know if that'll... If that works, I'm, I'm still reflecting on that. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are some folks that are doing, in fact, I went to this little mini conference over at Harvard where they brought together people from industry and academia for learning engineering. And what mm -hmm. they're talking about is big data and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. right? And I'm not sure I want to, I, I, I'm not going to put my money on that. Um, but the term learning engineer might be, <laughs> might be a good one. <laughs> if it's not... Uh taken by someone else. I remember back when I started, uh, uh, people were instructional technologists, IT, and then uh -huh. MIS became IT, Management right. Information Systems, took our term away from us, and then we've been kind of uh, in the <laughs> desert here, I guess, not knowing what to call ourselves, although uh, we've, lived well, through, we've lived through the transition from training to learning. I know. Well, it is interesting, you know. If you if you if you're at a cocktail party and you tell someone you're an instructional designer, mm -hmm. they they to me I used to say that a lot, and people would always hear it as, oh, you're you're in construction, or you know, they just you know, people just don't get it. So I know. It's I'm not sure that worked very well either. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me uh, shift gears here before we wrap this up to. Um, one of the things I'm looking for are stories of practitioners in the field you've had experience with. We talked about this a little bit earlier. You mentioned Ruth Clark. Uh, feel free to bring up an, another story about Ruth if you choose. But you also uh, mentioned Mary Tom, Steve Villachanka. So what have you got on them? Yeah, sure. Well, um, so I'll, uh, I, I did some 
One, one of the best things I ever did was to uh, volunteer for the ISPI Research mm -hmm. Committee and uh, met some really smart people there. Um, and, and, you know, there's a whole bunch of them, but, uh, you know, uh, Mary Norris Thomas and Steve Villachica, uh, we became sort of partners in crime, really pushing, you know, the research-based stuff. Um, we even wrote a little paper on, uh, uh, you know, how to how to decipher research and the sort of it was a little job mm -hmm. aid on how to do that. Um, that was an interesting time, the research committee, because there was really good research and then there was some really bad research that came in that was like hauntingly bad. Um, one of the things that I think people should know is that uh, survey research, getting people's opinions on things is okay, but it's not great. It's not the same as scientific research. And so when I see somebody doing their dissertation just on survey research, um, particularly re related to learning or performance on there, like that's just not enough. Um, so uh, it was sort of eye-opening to, to do that, you know, some great research, some bad research, and um, making research buddies. Uh, you know, th those two, uh, Steve and Mary, just, they know so much. Um, you know, they're my go-to people when I have questions mm -hmm. about stuff. So, so Ruth, so I'll tell you, I don't know if it's not a funny story. <laughs> I, I find it interesting. Um, like I said, I didn't know about Ruth's work and I started to do the research to practice thing. And then people said, well, Will, have you heard of Ruth? I don't know. And uh, so then I heard about her and like she was the you know leader out there. And I said, oh, I got to go, you know take a workshop with her and I, you know, maybe I'll introduce myself at this workshop. So I think it was at an ISPI conference, get, get in the workshop and Ruth's in the front of the room and I'm sort of in the side and, and uh, she says, does anybody have a computer cord to like, a, I forget what laptop she had, but, I, but she and I had the exact same computers and I was able to <laughs> lend her my <laughs> power cord. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I, you know, sort of bonded over that, and I was just reflecting on that story recently, and I kind of like the metaphor that, uh, you know, in some ways she and I get our energy from the same source, wanting to find the truth and all that kind of stuff. So, <laughs> anyway. Very good, very good. Do you have any parting words of wisdom for people in the learning field, uh, perhaps newcomers? Um, what, what would you, what would your guidance be? Okay, well, um, maybe two things. One is uh, seek the research, um, find the research to practice practitioners, uh, people like uh, Julie Dirksen, Patty Shank, uh, you, um, uh, Clark Quinn, Carl Kopp, uh, you know, Dick Clark, Ruth Clark, um, you know, there's a bunch of folks that do this, uh, they're really good at it, um, you know, they're bringing a lot of wisdom to it, and like I said, the research is really strong. The other part of it, sort of an opposite part, is be skeptical. Always be skeptical about what you're hearing, verify your facts, you know, get corroborating evidence, um, try stuff out, and get real good feedback, day-to-day -day learning evaluation feedback as you go. So. It's, it's really that simple, you know, just don't get suckered in because there's so many shiny objects so in true, our field. So true. Will, thank you so much for doing this interview with me. Um, again, thanks. Have a great day. Thank you, Guy. It's been a delight. And you are, you know, keep up your great work being the historian of the field. I, I'm, I'm honored to be a thank part you. of it. Thank you. Thank you.